Well, aren't you glad you came to church tonight? I believe God has something that he wants to do tonight. And so I want to invite you, if you have your Bible, to open up to Mark chapter 4. We started talking on Sunday morning about God's kingdom being a kingdom of peace. And whenever God's kingdom breaks in into a chaotic world, the result for the individual is always peace. And so we began looking last night at the parables that Jesus began to speak in chapter 4. After two years of his earthly ministry, for the first time, he begins to speak in parables. And we looked at that most familiar parable of the parable of the soils or the parable of the sower. So what I want to do tonight, we're not going to get into the explanation, but we are going to read verses 10 and 11 to tie together last night with tonight. Because after we read verses 10 and 11, I want us to jump down to verses 21 through verses 25. And if you have subheadings in your Bible, you'll notice that it will say the parable of the lamp. And I will tell you, I, I think it's all right. I mean, we are just who we are tonight. And so I'm just going to tell you that this is a parable that I've misunderstood all my life. You know, it's a frightening thing to wake up as an old man and realize that you've gotten it wrong. I had a youth leader. I told you that I started going to the church of the Nazarene when I was 15 years old. And my youth leader was one of those youth leaders that wanted to scare you straight. You know, people like that. She would always say, be sure your sins will find you out. I was at her home not too long ago in Kankakee, Illinois. I was sitting around the breakfast table and she said to me, brother, she said, be sure your sins will find you out. I don't know what she thinks I'm doing, but anyhow, she, she still told me that. And she, in a youth group, she was talking about what you did in private would be shouted from the rooftops, all that kind of thing. And when you start looking at this particular passage of Scripture, it starts talking about things that are under your bed and, and being brought to light. Anything that's hidden will be brought to light. And, and I've got to be honest with you. There are things under my bed I didn't want you to know about. And sit there and act holy. There were things under your bed you didn't want anybody to know about. But see, I've had it all wrong all this time. And what I want tonight is for us to look at this particular parable, which I believe isn't meant to be a standalone parable. I think that it's meant to be a continuation of the explanation of the parable of the sower. But I want us to look at it and allow the Spirit to take us where He longs for us to be. Mark chapter 4, verse 10. But when Jesus was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And Jesus said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. Verse 21. Also, Jesus said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there's nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. It's an incredible passage. And you'll remember, if you were here last night, how many of you were here last evening? Well, all of you are familiar with the parable of the sower, correct? A sower went forth to sow. There's four different types of soil that the seed falls on. And one of the soil produces fruit. And as Jesus is beginning to explain to his men about this particular parable, because you've got to remember, we're well into the second year of Jesus' earthly ministry. And this is the first time that Jesus begins to teach in parables. So it kind of confuses, it catches individuals, it catches his men off guard. So they have questions about it. And as he's explaining, 
he talks in verse 11 of chapter 4. He gives us this idea of insiders and outsiders. And we just read it together. You know, to you, he says, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are on the outside, all things come in parables. So it gives us this picture. It gives this image of insiders and outsiders. And I would suggest to you that this is something that if we're not careful, it's something that we can greatly misunderstand. Insiders and outsiders. The reason I say that is you realize that the disciples did misunderstand this concept. The reason I can say that is if you fast forward, if you go to chapter 9, you'll remember it's at the end of chapter 8, after three years of Jesus' earthless, earthly ministry, for the first time he confirms his identity. It's Simon that says, you're the one that we're looking for. And it's the first time that Jesus basically has said, yeah, that's right. But now that you know who I am, he goes on, let me tell you why I've come. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to my enemies. I will suffer at their hands. I will bleed and ultimately die. But that won't be the end. Because on the third day I will rise again. This is the first time in three years that he's been so definitive. And the disciples, they're expecting a conquering king type Messiah because the Old Testament speaks of that. But they're failing to recognize the suffering servant, the one that comes before. And when Jesus starts talking about bleeding, suffering, and dying, it causes friction. For the first time, Jesus experiences with his inner circle the same problem that he has with the religious leadership. What is that problem? Unmet expectations. They expected Jesus to come in and to throw overthrow Caesar and set up a present tense kingdom with a present tense glory. And Jesus will be king. You've got to understand that. But he'll never be king on the disciples' terms. He'll never be king on your terms. It's on his terms. And so friction begins there at the end of chapter 8 that carries all the way over into chapter 9. How do we know that? Because in verse 10, 2 of chapter 9, it says after six days. So there's been six days of arguing. Jesus takes the big mouths. You know who the big mouths are, right? Peter, booger. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Peter, James, and John. You know, he takes them up on the mountain in order to, to, to have an experience. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. And we know that we get caught up because when they're up there, Jesus is praying, there's a bright light. And that's, that's neat. But, but don't get caught there. There's a conversation between Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. That, that's really interesting. But don't get caught up there. Because in the midst of it all, it's Simon that says, hey, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three booths. You remember that scene? And during the midst of it all, God says, hey, Peter, shut up. Okay, I, I know you're Southern and maybe that's a little bit, but, but come on, that, that, it, it doesn't read that way in scripture, but it says, hush, be quiet. Why? Because this is my son. Hear, listen to him. And see, if you and I are going to be kingdom individuals, we have to lie aside everything that we believe the kingdom to be and embrace what Jesus says it is. Because Jesus is the only one that has that right. And the reason why I know this is the purpose of the transfiguration is because later in Scripture, we're admonished, be transfigured. Okay, we don't translate it like that, but it's the same word. Be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. You have to lay aside what you think and embrace what Jesus says. 
So as they're up there, life is going on in the valley. You remember the scene, right? There's a father that has brought his boy to the place that he believed Jesus to be. The reason he's done that is because this boy is overcome with a mute spirit. Mark is very sure to say it like this because there's a lot of different scholars so-called that will say it's a physical ailment. And you know, when Mark says that he's overcome with the mute spirit, it moves it from the physical realm to the spiritual realm. I don't care if that makes you uncomfortable or not, but there is a very real battle that's going on between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And the kingdom of darkness has claimed this boy as his own. You remember later the father will say he throws him in the fire, he throws him in the water. He's concerned about his life. And while they're up on the mountain, he brings his boy to Jesus. They're not there. He's not there. So he looks to the disciples who are there, the remaining nine, but they can't do what needs to be done. How do we know that? Because later Jesus will question. I brought my boy to you. You weren't here. So I looked to them, but they couldn't do it. You do realize just because you're quiet, it doesn't make you holy. I want you to understand that. Just because they weren't the big mouths didn't mean that they were on board with the plan. See, they were rebelling against the kingdom. And because of that, they were powerless. You say, well, wait a minute, Billy, that's not fair. Because Jesus is Jesus. Those men are just men. They can't cure this boy. Wait a second. Have you read the word? See, this is Mark chapter 9. And see, the problem is, I've read Mark chapter 6. And in Mark chapter 6, Jesus sends out his men two by two under the authority of the kingdom to do everything that he himself had been doing. And we watch them as they go out under the authority of the kingdom. They begin to touch people who are sick and God makes them well. They anoint people who are out of their minds and God puts them in their right mind. And again, I'll say to you, don't you wish God would do that to a few people you know? You know, all the things that Jesus had done up to this point, they had done. So it's natural that the father said, I look to them because they had done it. But they couldn't do it. Why? Because you cannot rebel against kingdom authority and expect to operate in kingdom power. It has to be done his way not your way. So Jesus steps in and he heals this boy completely. Then he gives the disciples a lesson on desperation and dependency. And then they're making their way to their next place. And as they're going along for the second time in this section, Jesus is talking about the cross. But while Jesus is talking about giving his life, the disciples are talking about who's going to be number one. It's interesting, and I've heard so-called scholars. Have you noticed that some scholars are pretty stupid? I mean, I don't know how plain you want me to be. I'm just telling you how it is. They're not just very, very smart because they'll say, this is an academic discussion about greatness in the kingdom of God. No, it's not. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. These men are not academics. These men are average, ordinary guys. They worked with the strength of their back and the sweat of their brow. They're not concerned about some abstract ideal about greatness. They're concerned about who's going to be number one. They already know who number 12 is. Jesus already called Peter Satan. You can't get any lower than that. So they're worried about the other 11 positions and they all want to be number one. So finally, as Jesus is confronting this within them, John, in a very proud way, I love this. He says, Master, Teacher, Rabbi, listen to his words. He said, we saw a man casting out evil in your name. Now pause there for just a moment. 
the very thing that the disciples had failed to do. It seems like this unnamed individual was actually doing it. Because it doesn't say he was trying. No. The tense, he was casting out evil in your name. So John says, we made him stop. Why? Listen to this. Because he doesn't follow us. I want to say, good thing, boys. Good thing he doesn't follow you all because you all couldn't do it in the first place. And Jesus says, don't do that. I like to believe that he said, don't do that, dummy. How many of you would like to hear Jesus say something like that? You aren't real, are you? I, I, I mean, come on. I, I would like to hear it because sometimes I hear Jesus call me dummy. And I'd like to hear him call Don't do that. Why? Because if he's not against us, he's for us. In other words, we're on the same team. But see, they had this idea, you've got to see it, that they were on the inside and everybody else was outside. And it would do us well to remember tonight. I, I don't want to mislead anybody here. It would do us well to remember that God's kingdom is exclusive. We talked about this in a different service. God's kingdom is exclusive for those who, who enter in. How do they enter in? They come through the Son. He is the gate. We are birthed into this kingdom. Unless you've been born again, you are not a child of God. The world would like us to believe that we're all God's children, but we are not. If you've never been birthed into the family, you are not his child. The kingdom of God is exclusive for those who come by the Son. But here's the incredible thing about this kingdom. In its exclusivity, it's also inclusive. Well, how can you be exclusive and inclusive at the same time? This is the only kingdom that I'm aware of that invites outsiders to become insiders. This is the only kingdom that says that whosoever will can come. Oh, aren't you thankful for that? I expected a better response than this. I, I mean, come on. You can shout while the offering's going on, but you've got to understand that if it weren't for this case, if this weren't the truth, there would be no hope for any one of us because I'm not sure, but I don't believe that any of us are the Jewish race. And because of that, we typically should have been on the outside. But because of what Jesus has done, because of the blood that he shed at Calvary, you and and I can be sons and daughters of God. We're not stepchildren, brother. We have been brought to the insiders. We are insiders. You and I are joint heirs with Jesus. Y'all are king's kids if you've come through the blood. That's good preaching whether you realize it or not. We've gotten too respectable in the church of the Nazarene. You need to get a little bit excited. This is the truth of the gospel. And because of that, it should change the way that we view our world. It should cause us to treat everybody differently that we come in contact with. And it's reinforced in this parable that we're looking at tonight. And I've got to be real honest with you. I've hesitated with this because I don't like doing this, but I've got to do it. Verse 21 uh, of the particular parable that we're looking at, the parable of the lamp, it, it's kind of awkward in its original language. When I was at school, I, I took four semesters of New Testament Greek, enough to get a minor in it. Uh, I don't know a lot about it, but I know enough to mess around with it. And I've got friends, brother, who are really smart. They teach it. And so I can call them up and say, hey, am I on the right track? And if I'm not, they set me in the direction I need to go. And when you look at verse 21, 
the reality is it can really be challenging because in the original language, not in your modern translation likely, but in the original, it's really awkward. But in order for us to understand what Jesus is really saying here, we've got to consider it. When you look at the parable, and, and like I said before, many of your Bibles have subheadings, so you'll know that Jesus is speaking of a lamp. And when you look at this, I mentioned last night, I think it was last night, I'm getting old and I'm forgetting about different services, but anyhow, you remember I told you at some point that Mark was our first gospel account. And it's considered that Matthew and Luke use Mark in another source than they wrote their particular gospels. The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that's why you see the same story. And Mark and Luke actually record the parable of the lamp in this form. Now, Matthew will have a parable of the lamp, but it will be different. But when you look at Luke's telling of this particular story, it's interesting because Luke makes lamp objective. And what I want you to understand is the way he does that is he says, no one lights a lamp. He uses the indefinite article to talk about the lamp, meaning that it's generic. It could be this lamp right here, or it could be the lamp that's in your office. I haven't been in, I was in your office. I can't remember if there's a lamp there or not, but a, a lamp or, or a lamp that's out there in the foyer. Or maybe you go home and there's a lamp on the, the end table in the living room or perhaps the bedside table. It could be any lamp. And when Luke says no one lights a lamp, remember, someone is performing the action. In other words, in order for this lamp to shine, somebody had to flip a switch. Or when you go home, if you're going to have a lamp turned on in your bedroom, you've got to either flip a switch or, or, or turn whatever it is on the lamp in order to make it shine. You understand what I'm saying? No one lights a lamp. It's a very, very generic use of the word. That's the way Luke tells the story. But Mark even though in most of our English translations, in fact, all of them except for two, even though it uses it in a generic sense, in the original, Mark doesn't make the lamp objective. Instead, he makes it subjective. And the way that he does that is by using the definite article, the. Not indefinite, A, the definite article, the. He says, no one lights the lamp. It's a powerful image when you think about what's being said. And when he talks about the lamp coming or the lamp being brought, it's from the word, and, and I'm sorry, we'll get beyond this, but it's from the word erkomai, which doesn't have the meaning that I come over here, let's say this pink thing here, this pink microphone is a lamp, I pick it up and I carry it over here and I lay it down. This is the lamp, I move it. That's not erkomai. Erkomai is that if this is the lamp, that this moves itself. In other words, it's not someone performing the action it's the subject it's subjective remember moving itself so jesus in mark's parable here is actually saying does or is the lamp come are you with me nod your head or something i've, I've got to make sure i haven't lost you here because it matters does the lamp come? Is the lamp come? So in other words, it's suitable for a person rather than an object. So properly, your translation should say, does the lamp come to be put under a measuring basket 
Or does the lamp come to be put under a couch, to be put under a bed? It's a powerful image. Why? See, to us, I, I, I'll just speak plainly, it, it sounds crazy. Because you and I, we're New Testament Christians. And if you'll remember, I said in one of our earlier services that the Word of God, I think it was Sunday morning, the Word of God is filled with symbolism. And when we ignore the symbolism that's found in Scripture, we miss the beauty of the story. The reason I say that is, is because the people that Jesus is speaking to here, they're not New Testament Christians. They're Old Testament individuals. And see, for those type of people, the lamp has great imagery. Throughout the Old Testament, the lamp has great meaning. For instance, I could tell you in the Old Testament, the lamp is a metaphor for the law or the or for the law of God or for Torah. And, and you're familiar with this. Psalm 119, 105 says this: Thy word is a unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's used as a metaphor for the law of God. It's also used throughout the Old Testament as a metaphor for God himself. 2 Samuel chapter 22 verse 29 says this, For you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. So I want you to understand, the lamp is a metaphor for the law of God. It's a metaphor for God himself. But most commonly throughout the Old Testament, the lamp is used as an image or a metaphor for the coming or promised Messiah. I'll give you two of these. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 19 says this, Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for the sake of his servant David, as he promised to give a lamp to him and his servants forever. Now listen to Psalm 132 verse 17. It says, there I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp, my anointed. Now the reason why this matters, I can tell you're sitting there thinking, what's the big deal? The people that Jesus is speaking to. Remember, he's just told a parable for the first time. A sower went forth to sow. And all these people were Old Testament individuals. And now when he begins to speak about the lamp that has come. Not to be hidden. Everybody there would have understood that Jesus is not speaking about an ordinary lamp. In fact, he would know that this is, they would know that this is not a lamp at all. Instead, it's the lamp. In other words, they should have realized that Jesus is the lamp that has come. In fact, God's purpose in Christ is to enlighten, is to reveal. You remember the Old Testament is a shadow of the reality that we have in him. And now Jesus is saying, the good news is here. The lamp has come. What has been unknown in the past is now revealed in Christ. The lamp has come. It's an incredible picture, especially when you think of it in the dialogue that's going on between Jesus and the others. Now, this is interesting to me because I'm going to confess, I feel pretty stupid now because I've always thought that Jesus, when he's explaining the parable of the sower, I've always thought that he's just talking to his 12, the inner circle. But remember what we read. Verse 10 says this. To those around him with the 12. I always thought it was just the 12. But scripture plainly says 
to those around him. Wait a minute, Billy. You said they were on a boat, in a boat with Jesus on a lake. Yeah, but remember Sunday morning when we looked at the scene when they're on the lake getting ready to sail out, it did say there were also other little boats with him. So it's obviously not just the 12 that Jesus is talking to. And when he's talking to the others along with the 12, He's talking about the knowledge of hidden truths, the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And maybe I'm being too, maybe it's because I'm so casual tonight. I don't know. I'm being too honest with you, but I'm going to tell you, I get so tired of people talking about the mystery of the kingdom of God, about there's more that's going to come. I'm here to tell you there's not. People come to me all the I meet super spiritual people. Do you ever meet people like that? They make me nervous. They say, oh, brother Billy, do you have a new word from the Lord? They come to me. All, I, I mean, not every week, but a lot of weeks they'll come. Do you have a new word? And I know I disappoint them because I have to look at them and say, no. Folks, you do understand the final word has been spoken. I'm a little disappointed. Have I put you to sleep already? I mean, the the final word has been spoken. In times past, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God spoke through the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken through Son. There is nothing more. Everything we need for life and salvation has been provided. And for you to say there's a need for something more is to suggest that the word that we have received is inadequate. And I want you to understand he is completely adequate for everything that you need. Now he's coming again, but everything we need has been provided. It's an incredible picture. Especially when you think about, he's talking about insiders and outsiders. To you it's been given, but for those on the outside. And the comparison of the lamp suggests this. The hidden things can't. Or you could say it like this. The hidden things won't stay hidden any longer. In fact, they must be revealed they must be proclaimed. Now, there will always be those who stay on the outside. There will always be those who love the darkness over the light. But the circle of insiders is open to all. Eugene Peterson, I, I, I'm not a big message fan. I, I mean, I do enjoy it. But I think sometimes we put a little bit too much weight into it. It's one man's work. But Eugene Peterson gets it right in verse 22. I want you to listen to what he says. He says, we're not keeping secrets. We're telling them. We're not hiding things. We're bringing them out in the open. I'm going to say that again because the way you're sitting there, I, I just don't know. You all have become much too still for me. Jesus says, we're not keeping secrets. We're telling them. We're not hiding things. We're bringing them out in the open see the reality of this parable it's a powerful confrontation the lamp has not come to be hidden rather it has come to be revealed you put the lamp on a lampstand and this is where matthew will say the reason why you put the lamp on the lampstand is so that the entire house can experience the light the lamp must be revealed. It's not put under, hide it under a bushel. No! Now, I don't know if that's where the song came from, but wouldn't it be, that'd be a good place for it to. You don't put it under a bed. The light is not meant to be hidden. And then Jesus will emphasize it. If you've got ears, then you've got to listen. See, this is the powerful thing. 
Something is happening in Mark chapter 4. And you'll remember Mark is very brief. We're already in the second year of Jesus' earthly ministry. And what we see here is building throughout this section. Verse 3, Jesus will say, pay attention. Verse 9, he'll say, if you've got ears, you need to listen. Verse 23, if you've got ears, you need to listen. And then in verse 24, he'll say, take we heed what you hear. In other words, we're moving from a call to attention to a call to action. There's a shift that's going on. We're moving from secrecy to revelation of who he is. He's trying to say to those people, shine the light. The secret is out. That's their responsibility. That's our responsibility. The light has not come to be hidden. Instead, you shine. I am the lamp. I am to be made manifest. I did not come to be kept secret. So stop hiding it. Set the lamp on a stand so that the light will shine to all and those in the darkness will see and outsiders will be welcomed in. It's powerful. I'm more excited than you are. It's powerful because their reality becomes our responsibility. The question is, what will they do? The question becomes, what will we do? And that's a question that has to be answered. Because the way we answer that question or the way we live our lives will determine the result. Jesus will say it like this in verse 24. Take heed what you hear. And this is that Hebrew thought. Observe what you hear. Notice carefully what the teacher has to say. Be ready to learn, but then observe that in action. How you act it in your own life. There's an old Jewish proverb. And I'm wrapping it up, I promise you. But there's an old Jewish proverb here. That fits. It's either in the Talmud or the Mishnah. I can't remember which one. You can look it up. But anyway, it says, in the pot you cook for others, you'll be cooked. I want you to think about that. In the pot you cook for others, You'll be cooked. Well, why would that fit here? Because Jesus says, verse 24, with the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. In the pot you cook for others, you'll be cooked. See, this is the thing that I'm coming to realize. I think we've had this whole idea wrong. Not, not that we've had it wrong, but, but we kind of think about salvation and all that kind of stuff just, just in, in terms of ourselves. And, and that is true. I mean, you have a personal relationship, but in that personal relationship, you have a corporate responsibility. You, you, you realize that. And we often in church will talk about sins that we commit. Don't do this. Don't do that. And, and by the way, if you're living in sin, stop that. You don't have to. You shouldn't be. But see, that's what we focus on. We don't often talk about sins of omission or things that we fail to do. And you say, now, wait a minute, Billy. What are you talking about? Well, wait. Remember, for him who knows what to do and does not do it, for that one, it is, you know, you'll answer for what you didn't do as well as what you did do. The times that you were meant to be the hands and feet of Jesus, but you choose to turn the other way and walk. The times that you stood up on your soapbox and instead of coming down in the pot, you cook for others, and, and it's getting late, so I won't, but, but I mean, I wonder what would happen if people treated you the way you treated them. I wonder what it would be in your life if, if people extended the grace to you that you extend to them. You notice how quiet it gets?
with the same measure you use it, it will be measured. In the pot you cook for others, you'll be cooked. And the exciting thing about verse 24 and 25 is that when you read it, the verbs are in the passive voice. We're talking about language tonight, so I just throw it out. That's not what's exciting. But what's exciting, it's in the divine passive voice. In other words, when you read, with the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. You know what it's talking about? You know who will measure it to you? God himself. So you can say, with the same measure you use it, God will measure it to you. And to you who hear, God will be, more will be given to you by God. Whoever has... God will be giving you more. But whoever does not have, even what he has, God will take. In other words, if you hide it, it will be taken from you. And you remember in Revelation, this is the church to Ephesus, he says, I will remove your lampstand. Why? Because you didn't shine. Mm. This is heavy. If you hide the light, the light will be taken. If you cover it, it will be taken away. And Matthew will tell the parable of the talents. You do remember that, right? In what measure you use it, it will be measured. See, this is why I believe it's just further explanation of the parable of the sower. Because here Jesus is saying, shine the light! goes right along with scatter the seed that's the message we receive in mark chapter 4 up to this point it enhances the parable outsiders are welcomed in and see when we grasp what's heard then we're responsible to proclaim it when the seed you remember from last night merges with the soil of one's heart the life that is produced is his life, and his life should overtake. The lamp goes on a lampstand. The word is meant to be seen, not just heard. The seed must be scattered. The light must shine. Jesus said, we're not keeping secrets. The question is, are you? I, I, I know two nights in a row I've talked about sharing, but see, I'll say it again. We'll know whether or not we truly have revival a few months from now to see if the church is awakened to the work of evangelism. For too long, we have thought it's all about us. It's not. Amen. It's so that we can go out into a fallen world, Amen. into the darkness and shine the light. Are you doing it? We're not hiding things, are you? Something has to happen. We can't rely on government. Have you noticed that? They don't know what they're doing. But by the way, we're of a different kingdom, aren't we? So let's live like it. Jesus, can you do something in us tonight? We've been silent. We've dimmed the light for too long. Can you use us to reach the world around us? Help it to start in our own families. What would happen in a church that began to pray for their own families to come to know you? If they began to take those things seriously, I, I think maybe there'd be revival in homes. And then it would spread from the sanctuary out into our communities. If we really believe, Jesus, that our time is short, then we need to take this seriously. Can you do that in me? Can you do that in us?
With your heads bowed, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet, please. I know that's a little bit heavy for really, really good people on Tuesday night. But I think perhaps really, really good people on Tuesday night are the exact people that need to hear this message. The Word of God demands a response. The question is not, do we respond? No, we will respond. Every one of us in here. The question is how. There are altars here. Maybe you want to spend some time with Him. One has come. Maybe you want to come. Whatever it may be, as we're obedient to His voice before the pastor comes to lead us in a closing prayer, why don't you come as well? Folks, the world needs to see. Outsiders need to know that they're welcomed in. You do what the Lord have you to do.
Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come to you and God, your, your word has been spoken. It's been given to us plainly and clearly. God, I pray, dear Lord, the ones that have made their way to the altar, God, that they understand and they know without a doubt that you have heard. And God, as the, as the people prayed for boldness, God, I pray, dear Lord, that as this message comes out, that, that we begin to move out. And that we begin to shine your light into this lost and dying world. And, and God, that you would give us the boldness to be able to do that. God, that you would show us and that you would continue to reveal in us the things that you have already done in us. That we are to be sharing with others. God, that your Holy Spirit would speak through us and in us. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the word that your servant has given to us. God, I pray as we close this service, God, that they will continue to meditate on the words that was given to them. And God, that they continue to allow it to change and to transform who they are. In Jesus' name, amen.